So have you ever wondered how to get involved with multifamily new construction? Well, my name is Ian Flanagan and I've been investing in real estate for over 15 years with single family houses from new construction to big renovation projects to selling hundreds and hundreds of homes over the years. And now I'm investing in multifamily deals. So this particular video, you're going to learn more about how the process works of entitling land, getting that raw land ready to build on. So my business partner, Mike Watson, I actually set up a call for some other folks that were interested in learning about our deals and how to get involved in multifamily new construction. And he really pulls the curtains back and kind of walks you through the step-by-step -step process of how we actually build these deals. So if you want to get involved with multifamily new construction, all my information is below. We can set up a private Zoom call with Mike and myself, and we can walk through all the details. So hope you enjoy the video. So just a real quick background, and Chris, you need to get involved, brother. You know, usually guys, when they see this the first time, they get involved, and if you don't, we start sending you to doctor's appointments and psychology appointments. And I mean, this is, from when you first saw this, Chris, to what it is now, let me just give you a quick rundown. Guys, we're doing 10 projects in the DFW Metroplex. We have over 2,000 units in entitlement construction or de and or development. We've got over $400 million in inventory in the DFW Marketplex, in the Metroplex. Additionally, we've got about $180 million in inventory in some form of entitlement, development, construction, ownership in Utah. So we're totaling over $600 million now. And we've just opened up our Indianapolis marketplace. We've got our first project going there. It's a 48 unit. And we are off and running. We have what we feel like is a really secret sauce, how we find great projects, the way we analyze them, the way we finance them. One of the things you'll learn from me, we don't work with investors. We don't have investments. We work with partners. So we're very interested in working and then we pay returns that most people say to us, the first response they give to us when they meet us and hear about us is that this is too good to be true. And I want to explain to you why it is. And one of the things I always joke with people is if someone has a question and says, hey, this is, Mike, this is too good to be true. This return is too good to be true. I mean, we try to pay, guys, our goal is to pay 50 cents to a dollar on the dollar over an 18 to 24 month life cycle of a multifamily transaction. So you put in $100,000 and we pay you 50 cents on the dollar or more over an 18 to 24 month life cycle on a project that's owned by a business that you belong to. So people say, gosh, that's too good to be true. And our, my response is always, gosh, if that's, if that's too good to be true, tell us what return you'd be more comfortable with and we're happy to lower it down. I, I'd be more than happy to do that for you. But I wanna explain to you, real briefly, how we're finding the projects, why they're so valuable, why they're so lucrative, why we can pay what we are paying. And you'll say, you'll say to you, after I get done with you, if you listen carefully, you'll say to yourself, gosh, maybe I should ask for a little bit higher return because of how lucrative these deals are. Uh, as a case in point, if you go across the 10 deals that we have in the Dallas Metroplex, we have, I think our lowest return deal is 28%. So you take a look at a $10 million project and we have a $2.8 million profit as an example. And that's just numbers that I made up. $2.8 million like, profit. 8% IRR? What's that? Is that total return or IRR? That's total return. Okay. So you look at a 14 to 24 month cycle, but here's the thing of that 14 to 24 months, a lot of that time is spent in contract and funds aren't necessarily out at that point. But you take, and let me show you how we can pay these great returns. So we find these amazing deals. We have a secret sauce in our opinion on how we structure the deals, how we analyze them, how we put them under contract, the relationship that we create with cities and the entitlement process. Um, Ian, I don't know how, how versed these guys are on, on entitlement. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just give a real brief overview. Should I do that on entitlement? So guys, one of the things that we've learned, and I'll kind of give you how we can pay our capital partners the way that we do, we find raw pieces of land. We're, we're experts at finding raw pieces of land that are zoned multifamily that have great upsides to them. We take a typically a six to a 10 month contract timeframe where over a six to 10 month period, we will get these entitled. Now the process of entitlement, you know, when you own a property, you take title to it. Your name is on the title. Entitlement then by definition is the process of enhancing or improving the title of the property that you own. We take a raw piece of land that's owned multifamily. We put together all the paperwork that's required, the geotechnical, the surveys, the topography, the civils, the exterior renderings and floor plans, the flow tests, the phase one environmentals, 
We go through the public hearings, the city processes. These generally run anywhere from six to eight months, can cost upwards of $50,000, $80,000 per project to do. We analyze, we package these up, we get all of this documentation submitted, redlined, resubmitted, redlined, resubmitted, approved. And then we have what's an, called an entitled project. The project is approved. Now, if you were to stand on this piece of land when we put it under contract and stand on the same piece of land after it's entitled, nothing's happened to the land. You wouldn't notice driving by every day that something is different about that land. But typically, we've been able to double its value. So you take a raw piece of land and double its value. And that doubling effect is caused by the paperwork that we do. We then purchase the property and begin construction drawings and create relationships with builders. And the long and the short of it is this. Let's use just a, a simple example. Let's say I've got a building that's worth $10 million. Uh, I find a piece of property for $350,000. I make it worth $700,000 of the entitlement process. Generally, the land and the construction loan is about 50 to 55 cents on the dollar for our total costs. So if I had a $10 million apartment complex that I'm going to sell, you can rest assured we probably spent somewhere between 50 and 55 cents on the dollar and buying that property entitling it that includes the land and the full construction tests now between 55 cents and 65 to 70 cents is your soft cost your your realtors your holding fees your your uh title expenses that we get out of and we get out of these deals with about a 30 percent profit position so the neat thing about that is is banks right now are requiring about 25 percent cash on a construction loan so if our construction loan represents about 55 cents on the dollar, 25% of that is only about 15, 16, 17, 18 cents on the dollar. So I can control and create a $10 million asset with a $3 million profit with less than $2 million out of pocket. So when someone comes in on a capital deal on one of our deals and we say, hey, put in some capital on it as a partner on one of our deals, we're taking a very small piece of cash, a very small amount of money in creating a $10 million asset with a profit that is usually, listen to this one, a profit that is usually 70 to 120% more than the cash that we have in the deal. Think about that for a second. Where else can you take the cash that you have in a deal and have a generator profit that is can be two times the amount of cash that you put in the project up front? And it's that ability for us to create this value through construction and entitlement that allows us to pay fantastic returns to our partners. So we're very good at finding these properties, analyzing them. We do market studies, all intense stuff. You guys get a little more interested, I'll send you more documents and paperwork and you'll be, you'll be tickled to death to see all the, the, the stuff that we put together in our analyzation here, the analysis that we do. But one of the fun things that we do again is we don't do investments. Now, are there any questions on entitlement before I move forward to kind of how we structure our deals, how we benefit our partners, and how we're different than just a, an investment? Any, any questions on entitlement? I, you guys are probably somewhat familiar with that if you haven't done it before, but it's a lucrative process. And the other thing is these builders, you guys can't drive anywhere. I don't care what part of the country you live in. You can't drive anywhere without seeing new multifamily projects going up. They're going up. They're being built. If you're in the Metroplex, for example, it's almost on every major off-ramp of every major highway there's a, a new new project going in the demand is only increasing so we have a, a lucrative business we have a special way that we do it and i wanted to share with you kind of how we structure our partnerships as i mentioned to you we don't have investments and we don't work with investors so as you know i used to do this for many years and we did this a different way and i used to take someone want to invest two hundred fifty thousand dollars in one of our deals and we'd give them a trust deed on the property with a note that said, oh, you're going to get two points and 12% interest over this next 12 months. And you have to be a trustee on the property. And that's how we secure your interest. And, and then how do we get a construction loan? How do I get a construction loan with your $250,000 trustee? So there were some issues there that came up and we just said, you know, we're, we're looking at this the wrong way. Let's create this as a business. So what we did is each new project that we set up. So we find a new project. We put the property under contract. We purchase that property in the name of a new LLC that we set up that is specific to that business. 
for example, Ian is getting funded out of a deal, uh, let's see, on April 4th. So that's uh, two weeks ago yesterday. He's getting funded out of his first deal. We set up a brand new LLC for that deal. He, became, he came in and instead of being an investor to that deal, he is a partner and an owner. So we set up a new LLC and all of the people that work on the project and all of the people that contribute capital to the project are then owners and members, voting and owner, owners of the new LLC. The LLC owns and controls the property. So the fun part is if I've got a $500,000 piece of land and we get $500,000 in capital from partners and ourselves, the LLC purchases the land and we can own that land free and clear because the LLC owns and controls the asset and it also dictates how you're paid and the terms of how you'll profit in working in one of these businesses with us. Now, that becomes very good because then we have what to the bank appears to be and is a free and clear asset. The bank can then, um, once we get that fully entitled, we purchase that land, we say to the bank it's worth more than we purchased it for because we've entitled it now. Here's the seven months of documents. Here's all the, the work product that we've done. Here's all the fees that have been spent. And this is not a raw piece of land anymore. This is an entitled project. Now we can hire a full architectural firm to take our exterior renderings and floor plans, turn them into a full set of construction drawings, submit those to the city, get them approved and pull a building permit. And in that time, once we get the full construction drawings done and submit them to the city, we take that, those construction drawings and start contractor bids with between seven and nine contractors at a time. So while the city's reviewing the plans, we're getting contractor bids. So when the building permit's ready to pull, guess what? We have a contractor in tow, we sign a contract and we start immediately. And so we're very, very efficient with our time there. Additionally, with the capital partners that come in at the front of the, the project, we'll use their capital to do the site work. Now, how cool would it be if when we pull the building permit, we could roll up to the site and dig a hole and pour footings within seven days? I mean, that's just not realistic. In a multifamily project, when you pull a building permit, it's typically two to three months before you pour footings. Reason being, we have to do all the undergrounds. We have to do the offsite. We have to grub the site. We have to tear. Uh, we have to bring in all the utilities, sewer, water, gas, all, the, all of that stuff. And we're doing those during the time frame which we're getting a building permit. So the LLC that you would be a member of owns the asset that now controls that. Now, in our, we have an operating agreement that is standard for all of our deals. And then for each specific deal, uh, Ian will tell you, we create what's called an Exhibit A. There are JV terms that control our standard operating agreement. And it dictates how each member interfaces and is paid and what capital contributions they have to the business. Now, the fun part about that is, is we then take that asset, the bank will lend on the asset based on the fact that we've got a valuable project here now. We've got approved construction drawings. We've got site work that's done. They'll come in and do the construction on that project. And that's the only encumbrance that we typically have on one of these sites is that bank loan. Now, fast forwarding a year to a year and a half, what time that takes us to build these projects, depending on how many buildings, how many site issues there are, um, you know, a single building we can get done generally in eight to 12 months. A multiple building site might take anywhere from 12 to 18 months, depending on how many buildings it is. We have some that will probably take more than that. We have some that are 270 units with nine buildings. I don't know that we'll build all nine buildings in 18 months, for example. Uh, but the good news is we own this property in our business. The JV bylaws state that the construction loan is goes first. And then on our first waterfall, the two exit strategies that we have, number one are a sale. So if we sell this project to someone, obviously the construction loan will get paid off first because it's on the title. After that, our JV agreement stipulates that all capital partners get paid at the same time in pro rata to the amount that they put in. So the, the protection that you have is the property is owned by the LLC. It's not owned by me or Ian or Dennis. It's owned by the, the business that we're a part of. The terms dictate that all of the capital partners get their capital back in full before $1 of profit is distributed. 
And then we distribute profits based on how the deal performed. And a lot of things can happen here. You guys have seen what's happened with the construction costs have gone through the roof, especially lumber and a few other things. We've remained on budget on several of our projects with this, which has been phenomenal. We're slightly on one, we're slightly over budget and one we're slightly under budget. And these are wonderful numbers. So at a sale or a refinance, because some of these we wanna keep, uh, construction loan gets paid first, capital partners contributions get paid second, and then your ownership dictates how the profits are distributed. And all profits are distributed equally and, and pro rata to ownership positions and percentages. So there's nobody that gets paid first before everyone else, if that makes sense. Now, our two waterfalls at the end are a sale. So if we sell the project or if we refinance and keep the project, you know, we could say, we, you might get a phone call at framing and say, hey, Shawnee and Matthew were, and Lester, we're really excited about this project. We think we might keep it. Are you guys interested in staying in the deal and owning this long term, which would provide amazing tax benefits? And if the answer is yes, then we ask two questions after that. Do you want to leave your principal in or just your profit? You know, I've got guys that put large chunks of principal in these deals. When we sell them or refinance them, they take their principal back and leave their profit in as an equity position. So it's not even a taxable event for them to have a profit but yet it yields cash flow and amazing tax benefits in prorata and proration to your ownership position. And if you want to get paid out, then it's incumbent upon the other partners to pay you out in the refinance. So you'd still in either case, take your profit and your business profit and your investment profit, or excuse me, your business profit and your, your capital contribution, your original capital contribution. So very unique, they're a little bit like syndication, but not, not so much. Uh, it's not an investment at all. We, uh, Ian will tell you, we communicate on a fairly regular basis. One to two times a month, you'll get a, an email from us on an update. We have conference calls where we take votes. Uh, we just had someone on the deal that Ian is in come in and say, I wanna buy out the whole project. And this was not what we anticipated. Sometimes people call us, we market these projects. We get calls from builders all the time that say, hey, I want to buy your project. I don't want you to build it. I want to buy it and build it myself. Or we have investment people that come in and say, I want to be your partner on the entire project. I don't want these six other partners here. Can I buy them out? Uh, Ian's deal that we just did, he's been in since September of last year. He's going to get about a 30% return, 25, 30% return in six months, uh, six and a half months on his money. And he's immediately going to move it to another deal that we have going in, in uh, Fort Worth. And I say to myself, gosh, I don't know how I feel about that. I obviously, we wanted to pay him a better percentage than that, but we took a vote. I called the guys and said, what do you want to do? Here's what the offer is in front of us. Um, here's what the return would be. Here's a deal waiting for you if you want to jump over to this one and make this kind of a profit in this time frame. And, and everybody decided to do that, to take, take that profit and move off to the next deal. So... You know, it covered a lot of ground there. What questions do you have, Ian? Uh, what places might I fill in a little more information? Dennis, what are your thoughts, if any? Guys, I'd love to answer questions. Uh, nothing. I mean, it sounds great, right? Um, so is this is this similar? And I apology, guys. I mean, I haven't really got into it at this level. Is this similar to like what Trammell Crow would do or companies like that? Go in, build big multi-units, potentially sell them or potentially manage them? Um, I'm not familiar with Tremco, but our goal is right now, it's kind of shifting. We're hoping to maintain, we're hoping to build. So in Dallas, for example, our goals are a little bit different than in Utah, which are a little bit different in Indianapolis. But generally our goals are to in Dallas to sell one or if we did 10 projects in a year, we would want to sell one or two of those as entitled land sales. So they're profitable in that regard. We build the other eight and we try to keep two or three of those long term. Now, next year, we're going to probably build four or build eight and keep four. The year after that, we'll keep all of them. So we're going to start keeping and hoarding. We're hoarders. We want to have a, a big project portfolio here with projects that are paid for. And then we'll sell some of them. My goal is to have 100 doors paid for in the next three years, next four years. And I'm very certain that we can do that. And at that point, I'll probably just say, hey, I don't know how badly I want to keep doing this with 100 doors paid for with that income coming in over time. Um, could be a game changer, but if that's what those guys do, then absolutely yes. 
And it really comes down to a project by project basis. And we'll disclose that to you up front, what our intent is on each deal. Matthew, I'm not 100% sure what Trammell Crow's model is, but, but the difference is, is they are a, a large conglomerate. They're in every city in the United States and uh, they're doing large, large projects. And they probably yeah. bring in uh, large amounts of money and syndication money. Mm -hmm. uh, we're focused on smaller projects and uh, we're more of a, uh, we're a small family of, of, uh, of developers and, and, uh, and partners. Um, so Mike has a, a great saying that I love is he doesn't want us close. He doesn't want you close. He wants you closer. You're going to get to see the sausage making, um, you know, and, and, and be able to see how the development works from start to finish. And he's already shared with you kind of how we go through our entitlement process. Um, but I think that the biggest difference between us and someone like a, a Tram Crow obviously is their size. And then just the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the communication and close um, family sort of um, uh, uh, feeling that you get as you're, as you're working through these projects as a partner. And that's more, that's more of a, uh, probably a, a more appropriate way to say that rather than a family, but as a, as a, as a partner, you're going to uh, see how the process works and, and stay in communication with us on that. But uh, a lot of our projects, I think our largest project in Texas right now is um, potentially in Gainesville. And the first phase on that is going to be 150 units, potentially five to 10 years from now, it could be as many as 700 units. That's the largest project we have. We've got another one in Fort Worth. It's about 225 units. Um, where Trammell Crow would be looking at stuff that's in the 800 to 1200 unit projects and they're huge multifamily mixed use type yeah, projects. For We're sure. a bit more focused. I, I only mention it because I happen to have a father-in-law who's the CFO of that little establishment and so he's always y y yammering about what they're doing and uh, you know family and friends deals where I can invest over there um, and so it just it started sounding like it but a, a younger version of it potentially right so um, have you got, and the only other question I have, it's not directly related to what you're doing now is they're, they're, they're pivoting like these big conglomerates like that seem to be pivoting and going for neighborhoods. Like right now I'm putting two deals together where they're buying large tracts of land and building like 200 single family neighborhoods doing the you same thing. What's that? Yeah. 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 And, 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 yeah. You know, we might venture into some townhome for rent projects, for example, but I, we'll never venture into a single family home neighborhood for rent that the numbers on that just aren't the same. They're not, the returns aren't the same for apartment complexes. And, and there is certainly demand for that. And people are paying a premium on rents right now. Um, okay. So I don't, I don't criticize anyone that wants to do that. I just feel like the returns are better in our space. And to Dennis's point, then Ian will, t will testify to this. We're a small company. We don't expect to ever get big. I, I love what we're doing, but Ian, we communicate, we're available. We return texts, we're available on phone calls and you get a call back on our email. I mean, we're, it's, it, it might take a minute to get a hold of us, but it, it, it's daily. I mean, sometimes immediate and sometimes 20 minutes. I mean, it's very easy to communicate with. And most people get into this because they're curious about the development process. They want to see how these projects go from the start to the end, the life cycle of a project. Mm -hmm. And it's one thing to put in a few bucks and hope for a return based on your ownership position. It's another thing to say, gosh, I, this is really cool. And I want to be in the multifamily space. I mean, I think I remember Ian saying some of the things he said, and correct me if I misspeak here, Ian, that, hey, I want to get in the multifamily space. I want to be at the table when these deals go down. I want to learn the process. I want to see how they're putting these together. I want to have a sounding board on projects. Ian also knows if he finds a piece of land somewhere that we'll evaluate it. If it looks good, we'll pull the trigger on it. We'll bring them in and we'll make them a part of the deal. So our motives here are a little different, but yeah, we're, we're going to be very, very profitable of that $640 million in, in potential projects as they get built out. I'm, I'm having trouble believing. I think there's only one of those that we shouldn't have under construction by year's end this year, or very close to under construction. So um, yeah, great question, Matthew. Any other questions you guys have? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just curious how the pandemic is slowing things down for you, because it's my impression um, 
not on the multi. This is my first multi investment uh, scenario. I'm usually in the single family development mm -hmm. side. Um, so I'm curious as to are we slowing down much with the pandemic or do you think that things are speeding up on the rental side? Great question. You know, I feel like I come to work every day and I live in two worlds. World number one is, you know, I go outside and people glare at you if you don't have a mask on and the world's falling and we're going to die. All of us, we're going to die. If someone doesn't die on this call, I'll be surprised. Um, th that's the one side. And on the other side, there's this massive pent up demand. So pandemic has affected us significantly. The first effect that we've had from it is it, it's probably doubled the amount of time that it takes us to get a project entitled. I mean, if, if we don't get a city, cities, if they don't respond to an email or a phone call in the old days, we'd hop in the car and drive down and wait at the counter until they came out and talked to us. They don't even work in the building anymore. Right. So our time to get one of these entitled has, in some cases, doubled. Uh, now, the fun part about this is that doesn't affect you because one of the things that we do is we generally don't bring capital into a deal with capital partners like you guys until we're either entitled or we're zoned and we're almost entitled. So most of the part where we've seen the slowdown. Now, the construction side, the inspections from, construct, from the city has not changed with, as much with the pandemic especially in the last quarter, the last four or five months, as people kind of calm down about, hey, we can, we can function, we can build, we can, haven't seen a slowdown there. Um, the slowdown on that side has been the, in massive demand of workers and the massive and materials. demand of subcontractors and materials. That's been, mm -hmm. I don't know that that's pandemic related. I think that's just intensity of the market and the demand. demand. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the entitlement process is what's taking the longest. Are you saying then that pre-pandemic we were to six to 10 months or are we saying because of the pandemic we are closer to the 10 months? Yeah, we usually, if, if we hit six months on a project, I would get very fidgety and then tell you I get really grumpy and I start asking hard questions. We get in the six month mark. Now at the six month mark, we're happy for most of the way done. And we've talked about that internally quite a bit, but. Uh, there's just things we can't speed up. I mean, there's city councils, for example, that don't meet every two weeks now, they meet once a month. And you can't go meet in person. And if you have something that's a, a little bit that you wanna make your case, it's hard to do it on a Zoom call. It really is. It used to be that you'd stand in front of the city council and make your case as long as you wanted to make your case. So there's been things that affected that way, but one of the things you'll learn in zoning and real estate, if you don't already know this, forgive me, I don't wanna sound condescending, is once a property is zoned, then its uses are lots. We, in, in Texas, it's called a use by right. They can't tell you whether or not you can do a project. They can only tell you how. And we are very good at matching the codes, the covenants, the ordinances, the standards, the city set to the projects that we set. And we do. And once a city gets a working relationship with us, they love us. Because we don't come in and ask for variances. We don't ask for changes. We don't ask for exceptions. I mean, we literally are surgeons with the code. We open it up, we find exactly what is allowed, and then we do it. And when they try to push back on it, we say, what? It's the code. It's the code. They say, well, we'd rather if you did this. Okay, can you show me that in your code, please? Because we, under section six, subsection C, section I, this is where we found this, and this is why we've done it this way. Oh, well, oh, okay. Yeah, I, oh, yeah, yeah. I usually don't work in this area, but you're, you're right. So we're very professional that way, but as far as the um, timelines go, yes, they have been lengthened, but again, that wouldn't affect you guys nearly as much because again, we don't typically bring capital into a deal until it is either completely entitled or it's past its any, any uh, public hearings that are required and it's zoned. So once we have the zone, and we've got multiple reviews on our project with our full set of civils. And we know it's a, a when, not an if. We never, ever, ever invest on ifs. It's just not part of our, our business model. No, it's great information. Uh, I would just like, yeah, I would love to sit down and meet with you, first of all. But I'm kind of in the beginning stages of understanding this whole area. And I would love to almost go through a process standing back and just to, so I can understand it better because I'm, I'm kind of a hands-on person I learn pretty quick um, but obviously it's new to me so I I need more information for sure but I would love to 
definitely get more information. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things that we do is the fun thing for me is always, I just have, I ask for the commitment. The commitment I always ask for is, are you interested? I mean, I'm not going to ask you, do you want to be a partner? I'm not going to ask you to put money in. I don't, I'm asking you to be interested. And if you're interested, then we can get more information to you. Well, how this usually goes is we give kind of an overview. People are able to ask questions like they do. And then we will go and potentially pick a specific project. For example, if you wanted to be in Texas, the project that, uh, Ian is going to be going into is called Richmond Manor. It's named after our president of operations, Dennis Richmond, against his wishes. We told him we were going to name one of them after him. And he's like, I can't go into the city with a project with my name on it. It feels too arrogant. And I just would feel weird. And I said, well, now we're going to name it that for sure. Because <laughs> it would be fun to do that. And he's been a good sport about it. He's very, very unpretentious. But the point is, is most people say, gosh, I just, I want to learn more information. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to meet with you. Uh, and a lot of this depends on obviously your ability to have capital. If you say, hey, I, I do run across people that say, I'd like to learn the process, but I don't have any capital. Obviously that wouldn't necessarily be a candidate for us, but if someone has some capital they'd consider partnering on and working with, happy to show you. The first step would be, we'd show you all the documentation from a current project, one that you might go into. And once you take a look at our OMs, our marketing brochures, the due diligence stack that we will send you is an unbelievable, unbelievable amount of documentation as it gets going. You would review that. Second stack, the second thing would be is we would talk and say, okay, conceptually, are you still interested? Is this something that meets your interest? And if you are, we would talk about dollar amounts, and a specific project to point you towards. And we would then go over this again and again. Now, Ian might be doing a few of these, but one of the realities is you can't hear this enough. It is pretty intense. There's a lot of information. Uh, and I do, I love what we do. So I tend to talk fast and forgive me. But at that point, you would make a decision. We have funding deadlines a couple of times uh, a quarter. And we're just finishing up a project in Utah. We're finalizing the funding on that one. We're in the middle of funding a deal that Ian's getting in in Texas. Our next funding deadline probably won't be for 60 to 90 days after that. The funding that we're doing on Ian's deal will probably go over the next 30 days. That might be a, a good entry point for you guys, should you have interest. Um, uh, so questions are allowed, multiple uh, Zoom calls are allowed. Uh, if you guys wanna bring other people in, that's allowed too. Uh, one thing you'll learn is the ownership position increases by the amount of money that you bring. So somebody that brings in $50,000 is going to get a different ownership percentage or um, based on that than someone that brings 5 million in. So some people will say to me, Mike, if I have, if I want to put in 50, 250 or 500 or 100, 200 and 300, what, what would the commensurate or the resulting payout be? On that, we will show you how we determine ownership positions. We can go over the structure again. Then, if we get that far along, I'm more than happy to send you redacted documents where I'll send you the documents from a deal that we've just done with names and addresses redact redacted so you can read what one of these looks like. I mean, Ian just got done going through one. He'll be doing another one here in the next couple of weeks with our Richmond Manor project in Burleson. So, Whatever other questions you have, I'd be happy to help. So where are you at in, in Utah here, Lester? I live in Davis County, Centerville, but you know how does the Wasatch Front's pretty crunched together. So my business is mostly in Salt Lake, Salt Lake County. So we are, we're headquartered in Springville, which is just south of Provo, as you probably know. Yep. But we are, I was in Clearfield yesterday. We've got 107 unit in Clearfield going in. We're putting the finishing touches on phase funding that today. I'll probably send out those documents today and then the next, it might go to tomorrow or the next day, but we've done a bunch of projects in Ogden. We've got one we're working on in South Ogden. We've done one in North Salt Lake. We've got projects in Utah County. So we're all in and around your marketplace there. It'd be very easy for us to interface. And one thing we might do is hop in a car, a couple of us and go see 10 projects that we've done that we're not doing that are done and completed. Uh, in, in the Ogden area, we send you a list of addresses. We do usually quarterly, not quarterly, probably two or three times a year. I'll do a small bus tour. We'll take four hours and we'll do a caravan of cars to 12 or 15 projects. And people come and stand and ask questions. And instead of talking about something in theory on a Zoom call, 
we're standing at the asset. We tell you how we found it, how we financed it, what we did with it, who the capital partners were, what contractor we used, how did we sell it, did we refinance it, did we fund it, who built it, all of those things. And it's it's a pretty pretty neat little process. We did one of those in Dallas. We'll be doing one down there soon too in the next couple of months as we get more projects going. We have a 22 unit under con or under construction there. It's almost to the end of framing. We've got a 96 unit that site work has started. We've got a 40 unit that Ian's coming out of that are literally we're pulling the building permit any day. We've got a contract in place with our contractor and we're ready to rip. So happy to involve you however and wherever we can. Okay, great. Thank you. One real quick. Just curious, what is the largest project you have done here in Dallas area? Is it the 22 unit one? So Dallas is a new market for me. And unfortunately, okay. we don't have the history there that we have in some of these other areas. I'd be more than happy to send you the list of the projects we're doing company wide. I can send that to Ian and he can send that to, out to everybody. Um, our largest project right now is um, we have three of them going. I don't have any projects done in Texas. Okay. We're intending to build all of these. You know, usually when we open a marketplace, we'll entitle some raw land and sell the raw land for the first few deals, to kind of prime the pump, create some equity and some profits. We've got a few, few dollars in our hand. We came down well funded from our tech, our Utah ventures. And so we are building the, the first three projects out of the grounds are the one that I just mentioned, the 22, the 96 and the 40. And okay. then right behind that, we'll have the 144 units that's named after Dennis. We've got 270 units in a first phase on 11 acres in Fort Worth. We have a 33 acres total. We'll total almost 900 units on those three, three phases that we'll do. That'll okay. probably take us six or eight years, I'm guessing. We also have close to 800 units on our Gainesville site and another 454 units in a Ferris site down there. So the projects are getting a little bigger. Usually when we open a marketplace, they're smaller, more condensed buildings. We want to get in, proof of concept, and it has gone extremely well and we've opened the floodgates. For example, the deal we're doing in Indianapolis right now is only 48 units. We could have bought two and 300 unit projects out there and started entitlements, but we're very conservative. We want to go in and prove that there's demand. We've got builders that are excited to death. One of the things that's unique about us is guys on every one of these deals we do, we incent the contractor to also be a partner in the deal. So the contractor we hire for their five or their 7% fee, but we also tell them you need to bring some capital in as a partner. So you have a capital investment in this deal besides being the contractor, which does a number of things for us. I'll tell you, if they want to try to bring us a change order on a budget, they're not bringing just us a change order, they're bringing themselves a change order. They're financially vested in the deal past their builder's fee. We have our architect wants to put up, he's doing about a $200,000 architectural fit, bid for the 144 units that uh, is in Fort Worth. He wants to put up his fee as a partnership contribution. And these guys are all excited to get involved and create equity positions and make money outside of their normal business. And that's kind of one of my pleas to Ian when we got started was, hey, dude, you're a savage realtor. You do investments, you do all kinds of other investments different than multifamily. And you've done a ton of them, well-known, well-respected, new space for you. Come in and learn this, come in and participate. And Ian's whole play was, again, correct me if I'm not 100% right. It was, I want to expand my portfolio. I want to expand my knowledge. I want to expand my base here. I want to, I want to see that this table too. So we're fresh in Dallas. We're only there. Uh, and I tell you, um, we've got, Lots of people that are looking at writing offers so as we go. Most of you guys are probably aware of the, the intense time of focus on multifamily sales is typically post sheetrock because that's when the six month timelines come in for the 1031 money. The big pressure we get is 1031. I get calls almost every day. My client has a 1031 and they, they got 98 days left and, and I got a building that's nine months from being completed. Yeah. They want my building. They're dying for my building and they can't buy it. So we deal with those issues. But now that the inventory is in the air and, and working, we're going to see a marked difference down there. Thank you. Yeah. One thing that you guys that have kids know is your kids don't necessarily want to pay attention to you even when you're in Hawaii. So 
sitting there on the beach. My kids are playing, they're snorkeling, they're suntanning, they're off getting a Slurpee. And I'm like, or an icy. And I'm like, I, I can handle a call right now. <laughs> like it might be a nice little break from, from the sun. I, I got pretty, pretty beat down by the sun last week, but yeah, we love what we do. It's not a secret. It's uh, it's pretty evident. Yeah, and just as, as a capital thing, just real quickly, thank you, Ian. You're very kind to set that up. I know we started about fifty thousand dollars on our deals, and we go up to we have some people that come in and take down the whole deal. So they might be into the millions. It really, we love to get people involved at whatever level you're at, and uh, we go from there. So if you're interested in reaching out and learn some more, we'd love to have that conversation. And Ian, you're a rock star, buddy. Way to go.